Hello and welcome to this episode of Nerd Rage. In Nerd Rage, I am taking you, your soul, and throwing it right into the deep. It's gonna be hard, it's gonna be random. Chances are it will make your brain crunch. But that's exactly what I want. I want you to become more critical. Speak up. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you can science anything. You can science anything the fuck you want. I'm an archaeologist and my aim is to bring you lessons from the past. I'm not going to bore you with too much details. Uh, I'm talking big fat red lines. But pst, hey, if you want details, I can give you some. Mm -hmm. But Eddie, I can't do it, not alone, I'm afraid. Yes you can, do not fear. You are not alone. If it is too much for you, then don't worry, there is a safe line. I have submitted a pause and Google protocol. Every time you see this symbol, pause and Google if you are confused to what I am saying or what the term means. Come back once you know a little bit more and are ready to continue. For the people who are hungry for more and feel caged inside their brain, have no fear. Every time you see this symbol, I will give you more in-depth material uh, in the description. In Nerd Rage, I am your host Eddie and I'm giving you some random things to think about. Join me as I battle misconceptions. Hello, welcome to Nerd Rage and thank you for watching. I wanted to start off this channel by busting the biggest misconception about prehistory, which is my turf, that I personally know of. So what do you do if you're new to the scene, let's say uh, the prison scene? Well then you find, you find the biggest inmate you see walking around, the, the most scary one, and then you just go ahead and punch him right in the face. Then after that you hope you survive, obviously, and then you've made a name for yourself. Right? So, that's exactly what I'm going to do here today. I'm going to give you an example of one of the smartest people on this planet and show you how even he has misconceptions. You see, the thing is, uh, you have them, I have them, we all have misconceptions. Uh, but this is Nerd Rage, and we are here to sign something and bust some myths. Have you ever seen this dude? His name is uh, Michio Kaku. He is an American physicist who thinks about the future of hu humanity. And I seriously recommend uh, reading his book. Uh, he's awesome. I have, uh, I have tremendous respect for him. He's super smart. However, one thing just flabbergasted me. Uh, one thing stuck, st struck me right in the face, right in the pizza, uh, because on page 12 he writes the following. For most of human history we lived wretched lives, struggling in a hostile, uncaring world where life expectancy was between 20 and 30 years of age. We were mostly nomads, carrying our position, possessions on our backs. Every day was a struggle to secure food and shelter. We lived in constant fear of vicious predators, disease and hunger. Sounds fierce, doesn't it? Well, I don't even know where to begin. This, uh, this life expectancy thing is just complete bullshit. Uh, Hunter Garris often made it to 70. Uh, child mortality was higher though. Uh, but if you grew past the age of 6, then uh, chances are high you would, you would become 70. So, then about this struggle, it's just, uh, it's just a huge misconception and in, in part Hollywood is to thank for that, of course. Hollywood is to thank for a lot of uh, misconceptions. And but this this misconception has a, has, a, has an origin uh, also in scientific uh, uh, literature. Uh, I don't blame uh, Michio Kaku for this one, although it's it's quite a serious offense though. If you're seeing this uh, Michio Kaku, 
I challenge you to come drink a whiskey with me. I think our misconception about uh, hunter-gatherers stems from the fact that we are biased towards contemporary hunter-gatherers. Do you see something uh, common in these three tribes that I'm showing you here? All of the images and videos we see from hunter-gatherers alive today are those that are, that are pushed to the extremes. As you can see, the sun here in Africa, they inhabit the desert. The Inuit in Greenland, they inhabit the Arctic and the Kororai from Papua in, inhabit the dense jungles. These are not, these are not uh, environments which are easy to live in. That's why they live there today, because we push them to the extremes. But we cannot compare these people with past hunter-gatherers, at least in terms of uh, subsistence and ease of life. So, uh, Pollen data shows that Europe was uh, largely forested uh, during the Mesolithic and Early Neolithic. Try to imagine a huge swaths of forest stretching the land as far as the eye can see. Now imagine this world where you and a small group of people roam freely. Because there was no one else around, just hunter gatherers and animals. Try to really imagine this. Now, I live in a country where there are 17 million people nowadays. Estimates for the amount of people in the Dutch Mesolithic range anywhere from as low as 400 to as high as 5,000 people. Even, even if it's, imagine this, even if it's 5,000 people, that's still just one small village for all of that forested area. Such a massive forest has an enormous pool of uh, natural resources. There will be rivers with teeming with fish, there will be berries, there will be hazelnuts, there will be other plants and lots of deers, birds and small animals to eat. The problem is that these are not concentrated, uh, but they spread out in the landscape. Uh, you had, so you had to simply move to find and exploit those resources. Hunter-gatherers today might struggle finding natural resources to exploit because they lived in the extremes. But with so many sweet spots around all over the forest, hunter-gatherers from the past would not have had a tough life. Simple as that. Take deer hunting for example. If you find a sweet spot in the forest where you can ambush a game trail and then shoot a deer right between the eyes, right in the kissa. Let's say today's poor victim uh, would be Herbert here. How much uh, effort would that be? In other words, how much time and energy would I lose trying to shoot Herbert? If you, if you shoot a deer in the forest, how long would you think that it would take before the deers return to this exact same place. Just guess here. I'll give you some time. Would that be a year, uh, six months, or would that be three months, or a week perhaps? How long do you think it would take? Now, this is called hunting stand recovery. Modern day hunting data shows that it would uh, take only five days for deer to return to that exact same spot after one of their own was shot before their eyes. I'm sorry Herbert, we will rem remember you, but that grass, oh boy that grass, it was so damn tasty. Now think about this, how much of a tough life would you have if you could shoot a deer every five days? That's a lot of meat we're talking about, I mean if you shoot a deer, then you can eat for a long time from that. Especially if, you do, if you're not fuzzy about eating the parts that we don't eat or... Uh, yeah. And remember, there wouldn't just be deer stands. There would be fish and birds and berries and hazelnuts and wild apples and so much more. Also, think about this for a moment. If life was such a struggle back then, then how come we have su such a huge wealth of Paleo and Mesolithic arts? The archaeological data does not suggest hardship here. Take for example this cave painting, uh, the Dance of the Kogel it's called. Uh, nine women are depicted here. Some are painted in black and others in red. 
Uh, they're dancing around a small male figure in the center with an abnormally large uh, schlong, so to say. Along with humans, there are several animals also de depicted. And this is also very important to note. Oh really, you show me the schlong and then you're going to focus on the animals? Yes, I'm sorry. But the thing is, if you're truly uh, living with nature, with animals around you, then you start to see yourself as an agent within that system. Uh, nature is not separated, if you will, from the human world, so to say. But I will discuss that in another video. Moving on. Here is an 8,000 year old depiction of a man collecting honey on a rock face. Now, I don't know if it's true for this specific site, but uh, honey can be infused with weird substances. Uh, as the bees just go around sucking the juice out of everything, uh, sometimes that happens to be a natural high. Take for example the rhododendron. This is a plant that contains gryanotoxin, a substance that can cause uh, mild headaches if taken uh, in light doses and will cause hallucinations. There's a wonderful documentary about a hunter-gatherer tribe alive today in Nepal that, see that actively seek out this tripping honey. A link in the description, uh, much that we learned there, I suggest watching that. The point that I'm trying to make here is that hunter-gatherers have enough spare time to seek out the narcotics and consume them. There's also a plethora of evidence uh, su supporting the use of magic mushrooms, for example, throughout uh, prehistory. In 1992, uh, Italian ethnobotanist Giorgio Samorini found a painted rock mural uh, depicting mushrooms in Tassili na Agier. I think I'm butchering that, but it's a mountain range in the Algerian section of the Sahara Desert. The, magic, the mushrooms depicted in the mural are speculated to be psyso, uh, psilocybe, hmm, wait, psilocybe maria, I think I butchered it again, a psychoactive mushroom species native to Algeria and Morocco. However, might I suggest you watch your head in this cave because there's not much room. In conclusion, I think it's safe to say that hunter-gatherers did not have it as tough as we thought. There are some that go so far as to call it an original affluent society, a sort of a utopia, if you will, without war, violence and with respect to nature. Uh, this idea originated in the 70s, no surprise there. However, this is most certainly taking it a bit too far. Hunter-gatherers uh, surely did practice uh, warfare and violence and but that's a topic for another video Nevertheless, there are certain values and ways of seeing things we can learn from hunter-gatherer society But that's also a topic for another video. So there you have it I just gave you a quick glimpse about hunter-gatherer life uh, a surface skim if you will But there's a whole pool where you can dive into so please, people, I'm asking you to ditch this idea of caveman living in agony all the time, getting attacked by everything, hungry, miserable, sick, tired. It's just complete foolery. All right, peeps, I hope I busted some myths today. I uh, hope you learned something. Uh, if there's anything you'd like to know more about, let me know in the comments. Quick words about me. I didn't really pursue a career in uh, archaeology after my degree. But during my study, I found I had a lot of eye openers. And my goal here now on YouTube is to share these with everyone. Because I think science should be for everyone and everyone can do it. I love making these videos and I would like to hear from you guys. Alright, Eddie the Eagle out.